Okay, hello everybody. My name is Madeline Pig, and today I'll be talking to you about the ecologist Eugene Odom. Here is just some background information on his education, and one thing to note was when he started out, um, ecology was not seen as a really important subject, but um, throughout his career he kind of made it more important. And here's a bit about his legacy. Um, he founded the Odom School of Ecology, which was the first university of its kind to focus solely on ecology, so he's known as the father of modern ecology. He also pioneered the concept of an ecosystem. He's known as an ecosystem ecologist, and he has awards named after him. And when he died, he donated most of his money to different universities. Here are his most famous publications and their citations next to them. Um, the most famous publication is actually a textbook, but I couldn't cover a textbook in this amount of time. So we're gonna be talking about the strategy of ecosystem development. And he starts out his paper just defining a couple terms. So ecological succession is just the development of ecosystems. And he said it was thought of as a single, like straightforward uh, idea. And it's a bit more complicated than that. And he defines an ecosystem <coughs> as a unit of biological organization made up of all the organisms in a given area interacting with the physical environment so that a flow of energy leads to characteristic trophic structure and material cycles within the system. That's a bit of a mouthful, but it is in line with what we talked about in class. So, okay. In this paper, he talks about a young ecosystem becoming a, a mature ecosystem, and he gives um, 24 attributes to each uh, scenario and what how they would fall in line with either being young or mature. And there's a table in this paper that lists each attribute, and I'll explain each one of them in just a second. So here's the table I was talking about, and firstly, we're gonna go through items uh, one through five, which he describes as the bioenergetics of the ecosystem. And um, in this first line here, you can see it talks about a PR ratio. So P is talking about photosynthesis, and R is respiration. And um, early on, this ratio is going to be less, I mean, sorry, greater than one, unless there's a special case where there is organic pollution occurring, then it will be less than one. But as it matures, um, both numbers will approach one. And um, this PB ratio, I think I talked about that in the next slide, but B is just referring to biomass. And um, let me see. Okay, so PB, the photosynthesis, should remain the, about the same or decrease while biomass increases. And that biomass is going to increase also in like uh, plant litter as well as just bigger plant structures. And that ratio will decrease as time goes on. And the biomass to energy ratio will increase. And um, you're going to see the highest yield for resources in young ecosystems. That's why he said that we ha our goals conflict with nature because um, ecosystems want to become mature, but we want to harvest when there's the most resources and that's when they're young. Okay, here are a couple graphs. Um, the top one is a forest succession from young to mature and it was in a simulation. And the bottom one, the microcosm was in a pond that he looked at. And um, PN is net uh, photosynthesis, and um, in the first 40 to 60 days, <coughs> you can see that the net photosynthesis is going to be larger than the respiration. And this stiff peak here at the beginning is going to be called an early bloom, when resources are most abundant. And then over time, these uh, rates, the net photosynthesis and respiration equal out, and he says that um, <clears throat> as time goes on, these two values will pulse back and forth, but they will stay um, relatively constant. And he describes um, the most productive time as eutrophic and the least productive as oligotrophic. Okay, and he talks about food chains and food webs a little bit. Um, he says early on in succession, the um, species are going to be, species diversity is going to be pretty low, and the food chains and food webs will become more complex as the system matures. 
And in mature forests, there's going to be less than 10% of the annual net production is going to be consumed. So a lot of it is lost through um, plant litter. And um, so a feedback control between plants and herbivores that keeps things in uh, balance is that well, plants will develop indige indigestible fibers like cellulose and lignin. So um, lignin is what makes trees hard and it's really hard to digest. I'd, and I don't think any animals can digest it. So that will help keep the plants uh, living. And um, these mechanisms will enable the biological community to maintain a large and more complex structure. Let me see. Okay, now we're back to the table for lines 8 through 11, and this is talking about the diversity and succession lines of species. So line 8, um, species in a given area, this is just talking about species diversity, and um, like I said, it's going to go from low to high. And number 9, um, when it says equitability, it's talking about species evenness. So um, let me see here. So for species to be um, more even, like say that you had um, like a hundred dogs but only five cats, that wouldn't be very even. But if you had five cats and five dogs, that would be species evenness. And for line 10, um, the variety of plant pigments, um, they will also go up as time goes on. And lines 15 through 17 are talking about um, nutrient cycling, and the nutrients that he mentions are nitrogen, phosphorus, and calcium as being the most important. And um, they are more readily accessible and open when ecosystems are young. And um, the nutrient, nutrient exchange rate will decrease over time as well. And the detritus um, in nutrient uh, regeneration, line 17, de deterious means like wasteful. So like um, the plant litter I was talking about can act as a fertilizer. And that's not as important in the younger ecosystem, but it is as it goes on. Okay, now um, line 18 um, is selection pressure for different types of species. So in a young ecosystem, the R selection species uh, favor. And then as time goes on, um, it's more suitable for K selection species. And if you remember, R selection species have lots of offspring and have a short lifespan, while the K selection, what could be a white-tailed deer here, um, have fewer offspring and longer lifespans, and they're more efficient with their energy. OK, so I kind of talked about this already. We are looking at, um, we want ecosystems in early bloom to get the most um, out of it, and nature does the opposite. And um, he talked a lot about this, but one quote I thought was interesting was, the landscape is not just a supply depot, but it is also the oikos, or the home in which we must live. And he wanted to create a perfect um, world for us to live in by increasing the variety of ecosystems that we have. And this is the model that he created to kind of create the perfect environment for us, where there are different types of um, um, environments all working together. And this is the variety that he was talking about. And um, he thought that this method wouldn't strip the world of its natural resources, but that it would be really hard to achieve just due to um, zoning issues and land that's privately owned that should be used for um, like nature preserves. And he talked about um, lawyers creating landscape law to make this a reality. And these are my references. Um, I hope you guys have a good day. Goodbye.